All right, hey, hey, how is everybody doing? I am Dave, um, as you can see on the screen, I am also the man who does judging for the win. So if you are interested in seeing any stuff from this, uh, from this presentation in the future, it will be posted to the, the YouTube channel. And so you will be able to review it there. I'll also have like a, a pinned post at the top if there's any um, you know other, other cool stuff that I think of or that gets brought up. So, all right, we are now uh, going to be talking about some some Brothers War uh, new stuff that's coming out. And boy, oh boy, we've got some some really great new stuff. Okay, so I, I have to level with you. Actually, the Power Stones are not actually new. There was actually Power Stones um, on that, that Karn card from Dominaria United. And there, I think there was like one one other uh, card from like the, the EDH adjoint set that uh, came out. Uh, but you know they're they're like new-ish, right? Like they're they're like kind of new for this set. Um, thing about power stones is uh, the power stones are kind of uh, uh, confusing, a little awkward wording. Uh, if you're an English speaker, I think um, the this mana can't be spent to cast a non-artifact spell. So of course the inverse of that is true. You can spend the mana to cast an artifact spell. Uh, however, that is not the only thing that you can spend the mana on. Uh, it turns out that uh, this is the only thing you cannot spend the mana on. So you would be able to spend the mana on anything that is not casting a non-artifact spell. So for example, paying uh, for ward or if you wanted to activate an ability uh, or anything else that requires a, a mana payment. Buying out of a Leonin Arbiter, uh, all kinds of cool stuff. So actually, the only thing you can't do with it is cast spells. And there's even some spells that you do get to cast with it, which is, of course, the, the artifact spells. So yeah, Power Stones, that's it. There uh, isn't anything like super crazy going on. Um, just uh, as a as a FYI, I am monitoring the, the Discord chat. So if you do uh, uh, hear me say I'm going on to the next topic and you have like something interesting uh, that, that you wanted to, to ask about or something that's uh, not clear, I am monitoring that. So you can... You can throw a, a message in the chat if that's uh, uh, something that you're interested in. But uh, yeah, so Power Stone's not super crazy. Uh, again, we've seen them before. Uh, speaking of stuff that we've seen before, we've got Unearth. And Unearth is at least a little bit, I think, more interesting than, than the Power Stone mechanics. Um, I, I remember back in the oldie days, uh, kind of dating myself a little bit, but I, I was playing uh, back, back when uh, Unearth was first introduced. So we got the... We got the uh, uh, OG Unearth card, Dregscape Zombie, and uh, very very fun mechanic. And so uh, Unearth, it is the the first and like probably like biggest thing that people kind of get tripped up on with with Unearth is Unearth is an activated ability. There are several uh, related mechanics that actually uh, are not worded as activated abilities. They're worded as like casting the spell from your graveyard. Um, so Unearth, even though it kind of conceptually is related to flashback for creatures um it is certainly not flashback for creatures in the fact that uh you're activating an activated ability you're not casting a spell uh, and so what that means is the the unearth uh can not be stopped by meddling mage but it could be stopped by pithing needle uh so that that sort of thing um you know you can you can kind of use that as a, a guide so it, it is activating an activated ability not counting uh does not count as casting a spell um, Unearth functions the exact same way, uh, including giving haste, uh, when it's on a non-creature permanent. And there are, uh, unlike in the original uh, Alara block, there, there are actually some non-creature cards in this new set that have uh, the, the Unearth ability. So with that, that being the case, that's, that's kind of a cool uh, new feature that they added in, some unexplored design space. So yeah, you can unearth stuff that is not a uh, creature, and it works exactly the same way. Um, so if you somehow were to make it into a creature... Uh, then, then the unearth would, uh, you know, it, it would be giving that creature haste, so you would be able to attack with it. And uh, the the other the other kind of like interesting, weird, you know, maybe a little counterintuitive fact about unearth is that you exile the card if it would leave the battlefield and go anywhere else, not just to the graveyard. Uh, so you know, returning to your hand uh, gets exiled. Put it on top of your library gets exiled. So here's here's a couple of. Um, Here's a couple of example questions that I came up with to, to kind of, um, you know, kind of go over how Unearth works. So this is probably like one of the most important ones uh, to be familiar with uh, if, if you are working with Unearth cards. Uh, so so you, you got the Unearth card and then you got the flicker effect. And remember what I said. I said that 
if it was going to leave the battlefield and go anywhere else, it goes to the exile zone. But here's a fun fact. If you play the flicker on the unearth card, then that puts it in the exile zone. So the, you know, the game doesn't have any problems at all uh, with that. Uh, and the, the really cool part is that when the flicker brings it back from the exile zone, then it won't be unearthed anymore. Because remember, when you like change the, the zone of an object, it becomes a completely new object with no connection to its previous existence. And so with that being the case, you're uh, dealing with a brand new non-unearthed Dregscape zombie after that flicker event happens. And so you, you would... Uh, no longer have the uh, the thing where it would get exiled if it goes to the graveyard. You would no longer have the the you know any any of the other related unearth stuff. And in fact, you wouldn't have haste anymore either. So that's that's kind of a negative. Uh, but the the rest of it, it's it's all upside. So if you were wondering then why why this card, meticulous excavation, um, has this kind of strange uh, wording on it, uh, then that would be. Uh, the reason why. So you, you notice that it says if it has unearthed, then instead of returning it directly to your hand, you exile it and then return it to your hand. Uh, and so the the reason with that being uh, the reason with that like kind of wacky uh, templating is is that if you were to meticulously excavate a a creature that you had in play that you had unearthed, then that would indeed return it to your hand uh, instead of exiling it which is you know maybe not really what a lot of people would expect would would happen so that's that's kind of a cool uh, uh modification to the template uh it doesn't have any any like um doesn't have any any like flavor justification for why that would happen uh, or maybe maybe it is a purely flavor driven ex explanation for why that happens would be a, a better way to put that so that that is the reason why the the slightly wacky templating on meticulous excavation there um now, Dress Down, Dress Down plus Unearth, that, that is a really, really fun one, right? So, what, what, do, you, what do you think would happen with, with Dress Down? I want to I wanna hear some ideas, and by here, I mean figuratively here because it's, it's over a text channel. But, chat, go ahead, and, uh, go ahead and type in what you think would happen uh, if, if you unearthed something when there was a Dress Down out. Um, first of all, it, it is possible to unearth something even if the Dress Down is already in play. Uh, because, of course, the dress down only applies to creatures losing all abilities. So creatures on the battlefield lose all the abilities. But, hey, when it's in your graveyard, you can still unearth it just fine. No problem, baby. Um, so in order to help everybody answer this question, we're going to take a look at, at the comprehensive rules here. Um, so we're, we're going to look at exactly how um, unearth is worded. So we'll have a, a clear uh, basis for, for all of the stuff that we're uh, gonna claim so return this card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Okay, great. It gains haste, right? So what that is doing is that that is that is putting the ability haste onto the creature. All right, and so with with that being with that being how it works, uh, the the dress down is gonna make it lose all abilities, but this unearth uh, activation is gonna make it gain an ability. So there are actually two different continuous effects that are operating on this creature that has been unearthed, uh, one that wants to make it lose haste and all its other abilities, and one that makes it want to gain haste. Uh, so there, there is actually no dependency in between these two uh, continuous effects. And if you're, if you're interested in the reason why that would be the case, um, you could take a look at, uh, I made a whole video about how dependencies work. So it actually would just come down to timestamps. So if the unearth ability resolved, before the dress down entered the battlefield, then that means that it would gain haste and then the dress down would apply after and it would lose haste. But if you unearthed when the dress down was already in the uh, battlefield, uh, then the unearth would have a later timestamp than the dress down. And so that would mean that you would actually lose all abilities first and then you would gain haste after the fact. Uh, so that that's actually kind of uh, really, really interesting uh, uh, and probably like not a lot of people would expect it to work that way. Um, okay. So as far as the exile it at the beginning of your next end step, um, that you can see from that sentence that it's not worded exactly the same way as, as the thing that says it gains haste, right? So it doesn't say it gains exile this creature at the beginning of your next end step, right? So we can see that the game isn't actually putting an ability onto the unearth creature that makes it get exiled. It, it's actually just putting a triggered ability out there in the game somewhere that says, oh yeah, and by the way, when the next end step happens, we've got something to do. Uh, so because the 
exile at the beginning of your next end step is not actually an ability that is on the creature that is unearthed. Uh, that means that it will not be something that Dress Down is able to take away. So, it, in fact, even if you unearth something, it will still have uh, the it will still have to be exiled at the beginning of your next end step, even with the Dress Down out. Uh, so that's another kind of, um, you know, maybe maybe not the way that a lot of people would expect it uh, to work. And the the if it would leave the battlefield, exile it instead of putting it anywhere else, uh, that part works the exact same way. Um, that, that part works exactly the same as the exiled at the beginning of your next end step. It is not something that is an ability on the unearthed card that Dress Down can take away. Rather, it's just something out there in the game where the game knows if this card is going somewhere that's not the, the exile zone, it goes to the exile zone instead. Um, so to, to summarize, you may or may not have haste depending on what the timestamps are, and you definitely will be exiling at the beginning of the next end step, and you definitely will be exiling uh, if it would leave the battlefield. Uh, so that that is the the, like, full you know full answer to the the unearth plus dress down question so that that is a really kind of an uh interesting interaction and unfortunately dress down like uh, as some people in the chat have observed kind of works similarly to dash and some other mechanics that do related kinds of things uh but there's like some some slight differences so you really do need to like look at the comprehensive rules and, and double check the exact wording of everything uh, in order to make a, a confident ruling on uh, questions like these. So if, if there's any uh, questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat right now. I'll, I'll give everybody a, a few seconds while I'm, um, you know, preparing my thoughts for the, the next slide here. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and if not, like if, if you have a question and, and like I don't get to it or, um, you know, if something else happens, uh, I, I do have an email address that I'm, I'm going to put on the, the end of the, of the presentation. So you can email questions to me also. So don't feel like this is like your last chance to ever interact with me uh, and, and ask these questions if they come up. So, okay. Um, next one we're going to be talking about, and I think this is a really important one. Um, so with, with this, uh, uh, you, you've got the, the defabricate and, and I chose defabricate obviously, cause it's like an uncommon in the same set. Um, so if you notice, the uh, you know first first ability is counter target artifact or enchantment spell. Well, you know that's not super interesting because as we said before, um, the unearth ability is not casting a spell. But this second mode definitely does indeed interact with the the unearth. Uh, so of course you would be able to counter target activated ability. The unearth, as we said before, is an activated ability. Um, so you would be able to, if someone tried to unearth a dread sleep zombie or like any of the like current unearth cards, you would be able to counter the unearth ability and it would stay in the graveyard. Uh, so, so that, that would be like one, one kind of interesting use. So it, it, it does kind of work okay against the unearth spells, but where it really shines is working with the unearth spells. And the reason is because, uh, or triggered ability. So when you notice here, it says remove it from the game at end of turn. Uh, and if we if we look at the previous slide where we had the actual uh, uh, text of the unearth ability, you can see that the actual ability that that unearth generates is exile it at the beginning of the next end step. Now here's the thing. There's only one next end step, right? Like there's only one end step that is the next end step after the unearth ability has resolved. And with that being the case, it is. That, that's going to mean that if you somehow get that unearth ability uh, exile at end of turn, if you were to counter it, like with a defabricate, then that means that's the only time that ability is going to trigger. So if you unearth something and then at end of turn, when that triggered ability wants to exile, you defabricate that triggered ability, then that would mean you would not have any subsequent uh, at end of turn exile me triggered abilities happening from that unearth card ever again. Uh, now you still would have the replacement effect that says like you exile it instead of putting it into any other zone if it, if it would go to the graveyard. Uh, that, that would still apply uh, because that's not a triggered ability. That's, that's part of a, a replacement effect and it's completely separate functioning. Um, but you, you, would, you would be able to beat the at end of turn exile me uh, that, that you have. So that, that's still a pretty good combo, I think, with, with the honor. Okay, uh, moving along, we've got... Boy, I gotta say, I was playing when they, uh, I was playing when they came out with Unearth, um, and, and I thought that was a cool mechanic. I, I don't mind seeing that one again. I was playing when they came out with Meld, and I still remember thinking, boy, what a stupid, uh, you know, what what a cracked mechanic, man. 
Like, I really hope we never have any more meld cards. And then we we all knew it. We all knew the meld was coming back. So, okay, here's here's a example. Here's an example of, of some of the meld cards that you might be able to see uh, at some point in the future. So if you've never played with this mechanic before, the schematic idea is that this card melds, and like I'm using that as like an English word, not a uh, magic you know, rules word. Uh, this card melds with this other card and they form this, this card. So if you turn the back of this card and the back of this card together, makes this oversized card. And you can see there's like kind of a little seam in the middle of the picture. And that reflects the fact that this is actually made out of two different uh, uh, magic cards. There's, there's, this is the back of one of those cards and this is the back of the other card. So that's, that's like conceptually what Meld is doing. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, take a look at some of the, some of the things that maybe uh, aren't immediately obvious about how uh, Meld works. And as you can see, there's a lot of bullet points there. Uh, there, there is going to be uh, in the future um, a dedicated how does meld work video going up on my channel. Um, but, uh, I, I wanted to kind of distill this down into just like some, some quick hits that I thought was going to be like the most important for, uh, somebody who like had never seen the mechanic before or someone who's like, you know, potentially going to be working with, with the new cards. Um, so here's, here's the deal. Meld, meld cards only have the characteristics of their front face anytime except when they're on the battlefield as the, the back half. Right. So like the, the only time when this has any of these characteristics is if it's on the battlefield as, as the Titania Gaia incarnate. Uh, so in your deck, in your hand, in exile, in your graveyard, it's going to be just the characteristics of the, the front face. So meld cards work a lot like double face cards in a lot of ways. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's, uh, one of the ways. So pay close attention to the wording of triggered abilities and replacement effects to determine how meld interacts with them. And we'll have some practice. Uh, you know, I, I threw a couple of questions together um, so we can get some practice with that. But when you're dealing with meld, you have to read the, the triggered abilities very carefully because some stuff that usually doesn't matter, like some wording, the exact phrasing, uh, a lot of the time, some templates that are almost always the same are not the same when you're considering a meld card. So here's a couple of rules of thumb. If you have a meld creature uh, like Titania that dies, then one creature has left the battlefield. So if you see something like leaves the battlefield, um, you're probably talking about like one trigger. Uh, on the other hand, two cards were put into the graveyard. And again, we'll we'll have some some ideas. Um, we'll we'll have we'll have some some practice where where we can identify like what which of these is is the appropriate number of, of things to trigger so we'll we'll apply this with some practical examples in the in the future very shortly here uh, meld is similar to transform and face down but is mechanically distinct uh, so meld the the titania gaia incarnate uh, is not able to uh, be on the battlefield face up and then be turned face down uh, nor is it able to transform so you would ignore any effects that told you to do either of those things uh, on either the Titania Gaia Incarnate or on either of the constituent front uh, face cards that, that make up the Titania Gaia Incarnate. If two cards, including meld cards, and the, you know that's why I'm talking about this rule here, uh, are put into your library at the same time, the owner chooses the order that they're put and they do not have to reveal that choice. So if you were to play like a submerge or something that puts the Titania on top of its owner's library, then you would choose which order the, the two constituent uh, cards were put on top of your library. Uh, and finally, if an effect causes a melded permanent to leave the battlefield and then does some action on that card, it does the action on each card that moved. Um, and so that, that is, that's like, uh, again, we'll have an example where we talk about that in a little bit more detail where you can see exactly how that rule works. So yeah, that's meld, that's the meld mechanic. So let's, let's take a look at some examples. So, okay, we got our boy Urza the Planeswalker. Uh, now, if you don't know, Urza the Planeswalker is made up of Urza the Creature and an artifact that's called the Might Stone and the Weak Stone, right? So if you meld those two together, then you've got Urza the Planeswalker. So let's say the Urza the Planeswalker dies. Do we get a Disciple of the Vault trigger? So if we notice, Disciple of the Vault says whenever an artifact is put into a graveyard from play. So one of the cards that makes up the Urza Planeswalker is an artifact. And unfortunately, 
what Disciple of the Vault is looking for is an artifact permanent being put into the graveyard from play. You can see uh, based on the wording, it doesn't say whenever an artifact card is put into a graveyard from play. It's, it's just whenever an artifact is put into a graveyard from play. And so what that means is we are not going to match what happened uh, if the Urza Planeswalker dies, right? Because the Urza Planeswalker is a Planeswalker. It is not an artifact. So the game is going to look what, what kind of permanent just got put into the graveyard. Oh, it was a Planeswalker? Don't care. Uh, and we... You know, maybe the, the fact that there's an artifact in the graveyard, I don't know, maybe Santa Claus brought it or something. But uh, uh, no, we, we did not have an artifact get put into a graveyard. Now, here's, an, here's another, uh, you know, kind of example. We've got the Obliterating Bolt. So if we Obliterating Bolted, the, the Urza Planeswalker, and it, and it died this turn. So what this says is if that creature or Planeswalker would die this turn, exile it instead. Okay? So um, we do have... Urza the Planeswalker as a Planeswalker on the battlefield. And that remember, when replacement effects apply, they're applying immediately before the thing that they replace happens. So immediately before this Urza Planeswalker gets put into the graveyard uh, or dies, um, that's what die means, immediately before that happens, the game is going to check to see if there's any replacement effects. And whoa boy, it looks like we do have one because if that Planeswalker would die, exile it instead. So that would mean that the Urza Planeswalker would get exiled. And what would that look like? Well... It is, it is an Urza Planeswalker that is composed of two different magic cards. Both of those magic cards would be placed into the exile zone. Um, I'm getting some, some stuff in the, the chat where it's like asking about like how it would work with, uh, you know, some specific types of triggered abilities. Uh, Blood Sheath Ascension is kind of an interesting one. It says whenever a card is put into a opponent's graveyard from anywhere, if Blood Sheath uh, Ascension has three or more quest cards, blah, blah, blah. So here's the fun fact about that. Uh, if we look at the exact templating, it says whenever a card is put into an opponent's graveyard. So if we look at our uh, uh, cheat sheet back here, two cards were put into a graveyard. Uh, so in fact, uh, the way that that triggered ability is worded, the templating indicates that we are looking for two, uh, uh, we, we are looking for the, the instance of a card being put into the graveyard, which happened two times uh, and so that that would mean that, that with that specific wording you would get two instances of that triggered ability uh, i will go into some more detail about exactly uh why that works and how that works and when i when i wrote my new set digest and i introduced meld for the first time uh, i went into a lot more detail about that so i'll put a, a link to that article um in in the comments somewhere if you're interested uh in, in a fuller explanation of, of why that works that way um, in the meantime, we've got one other kind of, kind of interesting one. So with this, we've got the, the planar incision, right? So we're, we're going to play the planar incision against the Titania guy incarnate. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why, um, I'm going to say the, the playability factor of the, <laughs> of, of the meld cards is not super, super high, um, because of, of stuff like this. So if you've got the planar incision, you played against the Titania guy incarnate, we're going to exile target creature and then return to the battlefield under its owner's control with a plus one, plus one counter on it. So, okay. When we exile it, you know, no, no problems, right? We, we've got, we already talked about this with the, the Urza example, right? We have two cards that are getting exiled, right? Um, the Titania, uh, whatever the something Argoth, uh, and then the, the land also is both getting exiled. Okay. So, we exiled two cards and now we have another instruction. It says now we're going to return it under its owner's control. Well, here's the thing. When we exiled it, it became a completely new object with no connection to its previous identity. So the, the two cards, the, the Titania and the Argoth that have been exiled are no longer melded together into a Titania Gaia incarnate. Uh, and so that means that when we try to return them to the battlefield, we're not going to be returning just one card to the battlefield. We're not going to return the Titania Gaia incarnate you know, melded together as you maybe would expect flavorfully. Uh, rather, what's going to happen is you're going to return both of the two cards that you've just exiled to the battlefield. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, it says with a plus one, plus one counter on it. So fun fact, uh, you would perform that action on both halves, as we talked about on the, the in a nutshell slide in the, the very beginning. So when you return both those cards to the value, you you would or when you return both those cards to the battlefield, you would be getting the the Titania with a plus one plus one counter on it, and also the the land with a plus one plus one counter on it. Even though like having a plus one plus one counter on the land doesn't really mean anything, uh, or it doesn't really do anything, uh, but it still uh, would have that plus one plus one counter on it if if you. Uh, um, you know, had some, some reason why that might come up. So that, that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, 
So that 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 is how like a, a effect like planar incision would work with the the, the new meld cards. So okay, uh, if there's any other uh, questions about meld, we'll we'll like doesn't look like the chat is uh, got a whole lot of questions about how that would work. Um, so let's take a look at the next the next new mechanic. Um, so in case you haven't seen these before, uh, it turns out that in collector boosters and set boosters there is a chance that you can open our friend optimus prime uh and like i think there's like a handful of other transforms i don't remember exactly how many there was uh but in draft boosters you cannot open these uh but in set boosters you can apparently so um the thing about these is even though it kind of looks like it would be new there's not really a whole lot of new stuff going on right here. So, convert. Look at that. Look at that. Cast this card converted. When it dies, return to the battlefield converted. What does that mean? What could what could converted mean? Uh, and it turns out that, and I promise I am not making this up, convert literally means the exact same thing as transform. Okay? So, in your mind, you can mentally like cross out the word converted and put in the word transformed. And that's what that means. And that that is that is actually what now I think if I was an intellectual property lawyer, I would be able to explain why they had to do that. But unfortunately, I'm not smart enough to be able to understand why they had to do that. So that is that is the way that that mechanic works convert literally the exact same thing as transform okay now we've also got this new more than meets the eye mechanic and it literally says the rules text for this mechanic in the reminder text i'm not sure why they didn't make more than meets the eye inability word if they were going to do that but that's how it works. It, it literally, this is this is the, as far as I'm aware, uh, comprehensive rules definition for what more than meets the eye cost means. So, okay. Literally, literally exactly the same thing as an existing mechanic. Literally the exact same thing as the reminder text. And some of these cards do not have the reminder text on there. So you might have to look it up um, if it comes out. But also there's one more. There's one more mechanic on these. So if you look at the back face of our, our uh, Optimus Prime here, you've got Living Metal. And again, Living Metal does exactly what the reminder text says. So again, uh, th this, this easily could have been an ability word um, if, if they wanted to, to work it that way. Fun fact, I'm not really sure about this, but like this, this kind of bugs me. So one in the chat, if this annoys you too, Living Metal, the metal does not have the the m capitalized right so more than meets the eye it was styled this way with with everything capitalized except the the so if, if someone can come up if someone can come up with a convincing explanation why the m in living metal is not capitalized i don't know if that's a transformers thing um if if like you know the the transformers ip has always styled it that way in their like in universe explanation um but like yeah i'm i'm completely stumped uh, and that, that's something that really kind of bothers me because, uh, in general, this is something that they usually do a, a really good job at, 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 like being consistent on stuff like that. So, okay. That's transformers. Um, that literally, even though it looks like it might be new, uh, it's, it's literally nothing we haven't seen before already. Uh, so, okay. Uh, next, next time, you know, that, that's not really fair. The, the more than meets the eye thing. I don't think we've ever had something like that. Uh, except if you're talking about like modal double face cards, maybe. So okay, uh, now we're now we're ready to look at some actual legitimate new 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 mechanics and stuff that's going on in the new set. Okay, so we got prototype, and this is actually a really fun mechanic. I, I'm actually kind of excited for prototype as a mechanic. I'm really excited to get to see the comprehensive rules text for prototype as a mechanic, um, which unfortunately has not been published as of the the date of this presentation. But um, prototype is going to be you know pretty pretty fire. Um, and I, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing how they like, you know, instantiate what this does in the, the comprehensive rules. Maybe that's just me. Maybe, maybe it's like people who like to, um, 
you know, read the comprehensive rules for fun or whatever. But uh, I, I think it's kind of a fun uh, mechanic rules wise. So basically the schematic overview is it's split cards for permanence, right? So if you had, you know, I know we already did split cards for permanence with like the kicker mechanic and with like the adventure mechanic and with like some other mechanics, they did like kind of similar things, but this is, this is like kind of falls along the same kind of lines in the, the schematic overview, um, split cards for permanence. So, so you've got like, you know, one half of this split card, you could imagine being like a seven mana, uh, haste six four and one of them you could imagine being a two and a red mana three two with with also haste uh, so that's basically how how you would be able to interpret that the only things that change between the two split halves are the power toughness and the mana cost as well as the things that are derived from those like the color and the mana value so if you were to cast this uh, for the two and a red cost you would not be able to disdainful stroke because disdainful stroke says counter with four or greater uh, on the other hand, if you cast it with the seven, then seven is four or greater, so you would be able to play the disdainful stroke against it. Uh, so that that would be like what changes, and and you know that that makes a lot of sense. Is prototype a characteristic to finding ability? No idea. Uh, as I uh, mentioned, the comprehensive rules is not out for this yet, uh, so it is not yet known what the uh, technical rules that is supporting the prototype mechanic is uh believe me i will have uh you know information down in the uh the slide and also in the uh, upcoming how does prototype work video that i'm also planning on putting out um so copying a prototyped card results in the copy having the prototyped characteristics so with that being the case I'm guessing it probably is not going to be treated as a characteristic defining ability. I'm guessing it probably would work something more like what you would see in the adventure mechanic um, where like it actually just like it, it doesn't it works like a CDA, but it doesn't technically count as a CDA kind of a thing. Uh, and again, we're going to have to wait until we actually like physically see what the, the text in the comprehensive rule says before we can make any firm statements on that. Um, casting via prototype does not count as paying an alternate cost though. So that is, that is another, uh, kind of an interesting thing. Um, it, a lot of the time when you see these kinds of mechanics, it's, it's via an alternate cost. Um, but this, this is, uh, uh, not an alternate cost. So that would mean that if you were able to play, uh, one of these spells through, uh, another alternate cost, like for example, if, if you had like something that said, uh, that, that, uh, like super omniscience card that they have in the new set where it's like, you can play the top card of your library without paying its mana cost. You could play this for the seven cost or for the two and a red cost, um, without paying its mana cost. And that might come up if you like, for some reason you really needed a red creature or something. Um, because as you can see with, with this two and a red cost, if you were paying, if you were playing it this way, you would have a red creature. Whereas if you were playing it, uh, with the seven, you would not have a red creature. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, idea. Uh, on the battlefield, um, the copyable values are whatever corresponds to the cost that you paid. So if you played this card for seven and then cloned it, then the clone would be a seven mana uh, value and it would have the six, four power toughness. If you played it for the two and a red and then you cloned it, then the clone would have the two and a red mana cost and it would have three, two as its power toughness. Um, so that is a uh, clone or that, that is prototype in a nutshell. So here we got Pyrrhic Blast. Now what Pyrrhic Blast says is an additional cost to cast the spell sacrifice a creature. Pyrrhic Blast deals damage equal to the sacrificed creature's power to any target. Draw a card. Okay. So what is the power of this card? Now we already kind of talked about this, right? Like, in the graveyard, it's going to be a 6-4, right? But if you played it using the prototype value, uh, then, then it would be a 3-2, okay? So what do we, what do we think? Um, would, would we be dealing 6 damage or 3 damage with the Pyrrhic Blast, given that we uh, blasted using a, a prototype automaton? So we've got a lot of people saying 3 um, in the chat, but does that actually make sense? Because... In, in, at the time when we're casting this spell is when we sacrifice a creature. So this, this Blitz Automaton will be in the graveyard at the time when the game is calculating like how much damage we have to deal. Uh, so that's an interesting point. Um, 
So so now now I see some people who are who are like a little bit less sure of themselves. Uh, it turns out the answer actually is three. Um, and so the reason is a little bit subtle, and um, the the reason the reason is a little bit subtle. And in order to to really really uh, uh, drive this one home, I, I'm going to go through step by step exactly what happens. So it says it deals damage equal to the sacrificed creature's power. Okay, so. Notice how we're, we're looking at, we, we have this template as the word creature, right? We don't say creature card, so that's already a big hint. Because when it is in the graveyard, the game considers it a creature card. Uh, as you saw, um, you know, with, with some other stuff uh, earlier on in the presentation, uh, creature card is the, the specific template that is appropriate to use uh, when we're talking about a card in the graveyard. We saw that with like the, the, the meld template, for example, with the triggered abilities. Um, so... We are not looking for a creature card. We're looking for a creature. Uh, and so that means we're looking at the, the creature that we sacrificed. And the creature that we sacrificed is specifically referring to the object that was on the battlefield at the time when we were casting this Puric Blast. Um, now, there are some specific rules in the, the 400.7 section of the CR that specifically allow us to be able to um, look at the characteristics of the objects that were used to pay the cost for this spell. So we actually do get to look at what this Blitz Automaton looked like when it was on the battlefield. And so actually, you know, that's the same reason why if, for example, we were to play like a giant growth on the Blitz Automaton and then use a Pyrrhic Blast, uh, you know, we would get the three extra damage because it would have the three extra power uh, from from the uh, giant growth. So that that is in fact the, the way that that situation would work. So, okay, that is... That is the, the answer to that question and the, the reason for that answer. Hopefully that made sense. If, if not, then uh, maybe at the end of the presentation I can uh, talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but now we're, we're into bonus round, right? Everybody loves the bonus round. I, I promise you, you are going to like absolutely go bananas when you see some of these questions. Absolutely bananas, right? Okay, so we're going to start things off, off easy. Uh, I want everybody in the, the chat here to, to go ahead and, and use the thumbs up or the thumbs down to vote on this. Uh, so go ahead, and, go ahead and vote on the question. Thumbs up or thumbs down. Can we use the Tormod's Crypt to nerf Deathbloom Ritualist? Uh, you know, it would be like a one-time, it would be a one-time nerf. Um, because, you know, of course, the Tormod script is a one-time use kind of a thing. And uh, boy, oh boy, we got, whoo, boy, we got more downvotes than, uh, you know, I'm going to insert a political joke here uh, that's appropriate to whatever political ideologies whatever person watching this uh, subscribes to. So, but uh, we are we are getting downvoted pretty heavily on that question, and that is, in fact, the correct answer. So, with the Deathbloom Ritualist, uh, we have an ability that can add mana to your mana pool, and also is not a loyalty ability, and also does not have a target. And so those three characteristics taken together mean that this is a mana ability, and as such, it does not use the stack, it cannot be responded to. So that means that even though it is possible that you would not be able to make mana with this, it still counts as a mana ability, and it still has all the super protections that mana abilities get. Um, so that would mean that, that you would not be able to activate Tormod's Crypt in response to this ability because it's a mana ability. So, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, you know, starting things off slow, uh, a lot of people got that one right. Hopefully, um, hopefully, like, some of these next ones are going to be a little bit more stimulating. So, okay, question, question two. Amy says, I'm going to play Kale's Command to make a 2-2 Construct and put a plus one, plus one counter and give my Grizzly Bears double strike. Nick says, okay, I am going to lightning bolt your grizzly bears in response. Amy says, okay, in that case, I want to buff my other grizzly bears. Can she buff the other grizzly bears? Yes or no? And, and again, you can uh, thumbs up and thumbs down react to that one as uh, appropriate. So we have got a lot of upvotes this time. So I, I'm doing better with the I'm doing better with the Reddit hive mind on this question. Very nice, very nice. And that is in fact the correct answer. It is possible to change your mind 
uh, about which creature that you're targeting in a scenario such as this. Uh, the reason is because that if you look very carefully on the Kayla's command, uh, specifically this mode here, you do not see a specific word that you usually would expect to see on spells that do stuff like this. And that word, of course, is the word target. Uh, because it does not target, and this is not one of the uh, other choices that is specifically spelled out as being made during the cast time, uh, the choice of which creature you are buffing is actually made during the resolution of Kayla's command. Which means that if Amy says that she's going to Kayla's command one of her creatures, uh, then Nick can, of course, respond to Kayla's command by playing a removal spell against that creature. But Amy is then within her rights to not be... Uh, held to the original choices that she announced when she tried to shortcut through the the casting and resolution of Kayla's command all happening in one step. So uh, the game theoretical correct choice, uh, you know, if, if you were going to play Kayla's command uh, in a, you know, serious game of magic would be to say, I'm choosing the mode uh, where I you know, make a construct token and buff a creature, for example. But you do not have to say whether you are uh, making a, you, you do not have to say which creature you're planning on buffing. Your opponent does not have access to that information until the spell is resolving. So another important consequence of that is that, uh, the creature that you put the plus one plus one counter on does not have to be in play at the time when you're casting the Kayla's command, uh, as it would if you were targeting. So as someone in the chat pointed out, that means it is indeed possible to create a two, two construct token, and then put a plus one plus one counter on that said construct token that you just created. Uh, the other important thing uh, that, that you would need to, uh, you know, have that work, and it does work out in this case, is the, the mode where you make the token happens to be printed above the mode where you put the counter on the creature. And so with that being the case, um, if, if these modes were in the opposite order, then it would not be possible to make that play. But because they were nice and they printed them in the right order, uh, you would in fact be able to make a construct and buff it. So, okay. Um, that, that is the, the next one. Now, now we've got, I don't think I could call myself uh, a presentation about, about the brothers war. Uh, if, if I didn't have a slide that looked sort of like this, right? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, e even though this, this root path purifier isn't technically in the brothers war, it's in like the, the brothers war commander adjunct set. We'll, we'll give it partial credit, uh, for, for being in, in the brothers war, um, so yeah, okay. Uh, pretty sure most of the people uh, have, have probably like seen or at least heard of this one before. Uh, but let's let's go through anyway. So we got we got the root path purifier. We got the blood moon out. Uh, non basic lands you control or or non basic lands are mountains, but also lands you control are basic. So pretty pretty short rules text uh, for for such an interesting question. So. If we take a look here, we're, we're of course going to assume that the Root Path Purifier player has some non-basic lands because, you know, obviously it's an easy question. Yeah, yeah, they're all basic, no uh, Blood Moon interaction at all. But if the Root Path Purifier player has some non-basic lands, then that would mean that uh, we've got a really interesting situation. First of all, we'll observe that the, the, the Blood Moon is, is a type changing effect. It gives you uh, a different land type. So it's type, subtype, and supertype. In this, this case, it would be a subtype. Uh, this one is basic, and that is a supertype. So we've got a supertype changing effect here, and we've got a subtype changing effect there, and those are both going to happen in layer four. Okay, so we've got two different continuous effects that both apply in layer four, and really interestingly, if we apply this one first, uh, then that is going to change the number of objects that the Blood Moon applies to. And so that means that the Blood Moon is dependent upon the Root Path Purifier. Uh, in contrast, if we were to apply the Blood Moon first, it would not change any of the lands uh, to non-lands, for example. So the number of objects that Root Path Purifier applies to is exactly the same. So Blood Moon is dependent on Root Path Purifier. Root Path Purifier is not dependent on Blood Moon. And so that means that Blood Moon is always going to apply after Root Path Purifier, regardless of timestamps, regardless of who controls which of these permanents. And so practically what that means is that Unlike in almost every other scenario, the Blood Moon actually loses because the Root Path Purifier is going to make all your lands into basics, and then the Blood Moon is going to make all the non-basic lands into mountains, but by now all of your lands are basic lands, so they are not going to be mountains. Very nice. Very, very nice. Um, unfortunately, uh, we cannot change the, the lands to basic mountains um, in, unless you've got like some very uh, um, 
you know, strange circumstance going on. But that that is in fact Rupath Purifier and Blood Moon. So that is how that works. Tell all your friends. Almost certainly going to be a, a dedicated video about that one because that's a very popular ruling that's that's come up in the recent sets. Okay, now this is the reason why you go to judging for the win for your content is this question right here. You know, I was looking at this card. Mishra claimed by Gix. Now, what does this card say? It says if Mishra claimed by Gix and a creature named Phyrexian Dragon Engine are attacking. Now, you know, that's kind of interesting. Because I reached way back for all of you. All right, all right, folks, I reached way back in my memory bank. And it turns out there was a bulk common from a long time ago that was called Dragon Engine. Okay, phew. Uh, I, I double checked. The there wasn't a card called Phyrexian Dragon Engine. Um, there was not a card ever before uh, this set called Phyrexian Dragon Engine. So you know the fact that there's this you know card with a name that's pretty similar. I mean, like you know what what are the chances? You know what if there was some mechanic that Wizards printed some wacky mechanic. That, that had the potential to change the name even by a single a single word. Oh yeah, you know there was there was this stickers mechanic that they came out with in in Unfinity. Um, okay, okay. So you know there there were stickers, but surely, surely, they wouldn't have printed a sticker that gave you the ability to make something into a Phyrexian. And there sure was. There sure was. There indeed is a sticker on one of the name sticker sheets that has the word Phyrexian right on there. Uh, and so that means that, yes, yes indeed. This is a real life question. So you know what? You know what? You're Amy. You got into that legacy tournament. You spiked the 30% to get the Phyrexian sticker out of your stickers deck. You played that turn three Dragon Engine in a legacy game. You played that turn four Mish reclaimed by Gix in the Legacy game. On turn five, you played something that gives you the name sticker. And there are, you know, you can look it up. There are Legacy legal things that can put a name sticker on Dragon Engine and make it into a Phyrexian Dragon Engine. And then you're attacking with them all. You're turning everyone sideways. What happens? Go ahead, throw your guess in the chat. Everyone, everyone, I want to see everyone typing. I thought about this question and I was so excited when I saw this one. Everyone type in what what happens? What's gonna, you know, we, we got some we got some really good answers so far. We got some good. So here's what's actually gonna happen. Alright. We're gonna dial 911 or whatever the emergency number is in your country, and we're gonna call the fun police. We're gonna call the fun police right up because it turns out that only two cards belonging to the same meld pair can be melded. Now, I know this is going to break some people's hearts here, but Dragon Engine, the ye olde days Dragon Engine that predates the meld mechanic by decades, is not in fact a meld card. So it would in fact be a token card that isn't a meld card and or a card that doesn't form a meld pair with Mishra. So... If an effect instructs a player to meld objects that can't be melded, they stay in their current zone. So what would that look like? Well, I'll tell you. So you got the Mishra ability. Whenever you attack, that triggers. Each opponent loses X life and you gain X life. Love it, where X is the number of attacking creatures. If Mishra claimed by Gix and a creature named Phyrexian Dragon Engine are attacking, and you both own and control them, exile them, beautiful, Beautiful. You exile them. That's no reason why that couldn't happen. Then, meld them into Mishra. Lost to Phyrexia. It cannot happen. Because Dragon Engine is not a meld card. So you cannot meld it. And so they are both going to stay exiled. You are not going to have either one of them on the battlefield. So that is a 3 for 0. And that's the end of that's the story. Now, now, there is still one really cool thing that you could do. Because the creature that is not referred to uh, the, the creature that is not the, the thing that this card is 
the other creature that's not this ability, it's not locked in. It is not locked in. So do you know what you could do? You're also attacking with a ninja. You ninjutsu in the dragon engine, the real Phyrexian dragon engine, using that card that gives all your stuff ninjutsu. You ninjutsu that in, and then with this triggered ability on the stack, and then you would indeed be able to exile both of them and then mill them into the, the Mishra, whatever the backside is called. So okay, that's that's my that's my like you know salvage for that situation. That's that's actually a really cool yeah magical Christmas land soap opera level plot twist. Uh, definitely uh, be on the lookout for that in any legacy uh, tournaments. Um, oh, you know you're right. It says whenever you attack, so you can't ninjutsu in during the declare attacker step. Very sad. Very sad. Oh, I I tried to do it, guys. I tried to sneak that one by, and someone caught it. Someone caught it. They they got me there. Uh, yeah, you could do it. Wait, Master Transmitter? Uh, yeah, you could do it with the Master Transmitter. Okay, Master Transmitter. That's the one we want. That's That that one actually does work. I, I'm sure there's like some way that you could... Oh, it wouldn't be attacking though. Oh, no, it wouldn't be attacking. You'd have to find some way to put it into the battlefield attacking. Oh, no. Oh, that's so sad. Uh, if you had a token copy of Phyrexian Dragon Engine when you attacked... Okay, so that's going to be the same sort of problem. Um, if you have a token, tokens also can't meld, so that's not going to be very good. If somebody, if somebody can figure out a way to make this trick work, definitely let me know about it. Uh, here's my email address. Uh, you can email it to me. Uh, that is all the stuff that I had prepared for this presentation. Um, I had a blast putting this together. I hope everybody else had a fun time. Um, like I said, this is going to be uh, on the YouTube channel uh, later on if you're interested in, in watching that. But that, that is everything that I had. Um, if I'll be in the chat for another few minutes uh, like during the break time. Um, but uh, that, that is uh, all I have. So thank you for joining me, and I hope all of you have a great day.